Okay, today we shall begin the lesson with something really, really easy. You must have learned this before. It's called the Snell's Law. Heard of it before? Okay, you must have heard of it in the form of um, sine theta i over sine theta r equals to n. Am I correct? Is that correct or not? There's no tricks, huh? Hey, relax! Relax! There's no tricks! <laughs> correct or not? Up to no good. Up to no good. Actually, actually, there is a problem. There is a problem. You see, if you go from air and water, this is incident and this is reflected, right? Correct or not? Agree not. So therefore, do you agree that theta i will be smaller than theta r, and therefore sine theta i is going to be over sine theta r is going to be smaller than one, and therefore you have a refractive index that is that's going to be smaller than one, and therefore since n is equal to c upon the speed of light in the medium, it means that if this is smaller than one, it means that your v m is going to be bigger than the speed of light. Whoa! Yeah. We have just defined the level. <laughs> you know, whoa, 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 what just happened? <laughs> New material. But, but, okay, nothing wrong, right? This is starting from what you learn. And then... Da, 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 da. <laughs> so where's wrong? So equation is wrong. It's just like saying F equals to M is wrong. That is wrong. Uh, saying F equals to M is wrong is wrong. It is just that f equals to ma is not, it's not always true. It is incomplete. So the proper Snell's law. Okay, let let's put um, Snell's to uh, rest in peace. That um, the correct form is actually this. Sine theta one times n one equals to sine theta two times n two. No worries. If you use this correctly, speed of light will never be violated. Okay, that's the ultimate um, limit in the universe that cannot be exceeded. But I'm going to show you how to. And you're going to, yeah. <laughs> and you're going to tell me how, why. You're going to tell me why that's right or why that's wrong. Okay, Ken? So let's take a look. Huh? N1 sine either 1 equals N2 sine how, how do you use it in this case? So there's no incident or refracted already. There's only one or two. So let's call this region 1, region 2. You got this and you got this. This is theta 1, this is theta 2. So therefore, in this case, n2 times sine theta 2 will be equal to n1 times sine theta 1. Where you have a smaller refractive index, you have a bigger um, angle. Where you have a bigger refractive index, you're going to have a smaller angle. So it will work out. Cool? Can? Right. Let's try this question and uh, in two, two different questions involving this. Then we're going to take a look at this. Instead of looking at it from the ray perspective, we're going to look at it from the wavefront perspective okay uh, just just kiv that for a while we're going to solve problems related to this first have you heard of this thing called fiber optics yeah. okay good excellent so if you go to this da -da 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 -da, da -da 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 -da, and then this is n equals to 1.1 this is n equals to 1.3 and this is air so I'd like you to find this thing called the critical angle, which I'm sure you heard of. Um, so find theta c between these two medium, and I'd like you to find alpha over here, such that when it goes into the medium, it hits this light, uh, this 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 interface at the critical angle. And lastly, state whether alpha is the max or the minimum for light to be transmitted. Can I give it a try? Go ahead, go ahead. Use this Snell's law. Um, what should this theta over here be? 90, yes, correct. 90. So sine 90 is equals to? Come on, 1, yes, correct. Yes, correct, 1. 
Is there any big difference between like, like this and looking at me online? <laughs> now you can see the bot. <laughs> Previously the bot can be seen is just uh, made out of bigger pixels. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone would like to shout out what's the critical mm -hmm. angle? 57.8, okay. Then find alpha. No angle for alpha? Cannot be, I think can. I think can. It is which one? From here to here? Yeah. You mean this one or what? Like this okay, point one or point two? Point point one or point two? Which point? You're talking about what which one? Sorry? Like yeah. the right angle, which part? Which part? <laughs> this one? Yes, it is right angle. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course, yes it is, it is, it is. I mean, it is an important question. It is an important question in case you start thinking that it is not because otherwise you would not be able to find this angle, right? This is a valid question. How? Anyone for the value of alpha? The way to go about alpha is that you've got to find beta first. So how do you find beta? You take 90 degrees minus 57.8. 43.8. Okay, let's check uh, 43.8. Anyone got the same answer? Got 43.9? Uh, okay, no, I mean point one difference is fine. Cool. Now is this the maximum or the minimum angle? Is this the maximum angle or minimum angle? But what does it mean if it is the maximum angle or the minimum angle? If it is the maximum angle, it means that if you go beyond this, you cannot transmit light already. If it is the minimum angle, it means that you must go beyond this for light to be transmitted. So is it the maximum or the minimum? <laughs> so for light to be transmitted, must you go smaller than alpha or bigger than alpha? <laughs> or only at that value? <gasps> No, 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 no. <laughs> oh dear. Maximum. So it must be smaller, right? Sure not? Yes, it is correct. Yeah. Now the way to go about this is always to test it out. I mean, just test it out. If you go at a smaller angle, then what happens is that this will go even smaller. So you strike it at a bigger angle. So which means that you go through total internal reflection. Agree? Can? So just test it out. You'll be able to see it. Now let's solve a second question which requires a little bit more math. It will usually not come out in IB exams. I've not seen it before, but nothing about this has is not in syllabus, which is the Snell's law. Let's take a look and see whether you're able to handle this. Some of you might find it quite familiar. This is radius, and this is um, this is um, two centimeters and the light ray hits here, this is n equals to 1.3, and this is air. So um, if it goes this way, um, can you find the critical angle? So find the critical angle, that's a boring part, mm, and find the minimum R, where below which light cannot be transmitted. That means if you bend R, if you bend the cable even more, even tighter, then light will escape from the material. Mm. Give me a try. Just need Snell's law. And you need to see. <laughs> Don't peep, huh?
I think the answer is 6.67 for the radius. So how on earth? Now you start, some of you will start thinking reverse engineer. <laughs> reverse engineer mode. Oh, then 6.67 is 20 divided by 3. Now how to get 20 divided by 3? Oh, reverse, reverse, reverse. <laughs> Sine 90 is 1. I thought we went through that. <laughs> Sine 90 is 1. Anyone want to tell me what's the critical angle that's the easier part of the question? Sine inverse 1 divided by 1.3. That's 19? 50. Point. 50.3. Okay, good. Well done. The next part is the wonderful part, is the beautiful part. Um, yep. How? Now, if I purposely did not extend this any further, but if I were to extend this further, do you see that it must touch the center of the circle? Because any line that's perpendicular to the circle must pass through the center of the circle. That's the rule of geometry, right? Now, if I take sine of this angle, this is r, right? This is r plus 2, ah. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's r, and then r plus 2, right? <laughs> how, 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 how? This is theta, right? Theta C, right? Sine theta C, isn't it equals to R divided by R plus 2? <laughs> Hannah, at the rate that, looking at the rate that your eyes are blinking, uh, do you need help? <laughs> yeah. So r divided by r plus 2 is equals to sine theta. And even more elegant is sine theta is 1 upon 1 1.3. So you don't even need to punch in calculator kind. Yeah? You just need a cross multiplication, you get the answer. But if you bend any smaller than this, then the light will exceed already. Uh, because the angle incident is going to be smaller than crit uh, critical angle. Okay? And that's why fiber optics, if you deal with fiber optics, you never ask to bend the thing too much. Um, if you bend too much, light will come out. Of course, that's not assuming that you break the glass fiber, right? So you never bend the fiber optics. Nice, uh, I like this kind of question. Uh. No complex math, no complex numbers, but yet it is quite interesting. Yeah? Ready to move on? Can? Okay, the next one, you might have seen it before. Do you know what's the difference between wave fronts and rays? That is to say, if I have a ray going this way, if you look at the sunlight, the ray comes in, there is this thing called the wave fronts. So if you are lonely and you're emo, you look at, uh, you go to East Coast, you look at the waves coming in, um, the waves that you see coming in, they are the wave fronts. Okay, they are the wave fronts. Actually, most of the time, you see wave fronts, not, not rays. Rays are lines perpendicular to the wave fronts. So that indicates the direction of motion of the wave. Okay? So it's a rule, uh, wave, fronts and wave, uh, wave fronts and rays, they must be perpendicular to each other. Cool? Now let's take a look what happens when this strikes an interface. So say, for example, if the wave were to come in this way, and then it turns this way. And then it goes into this region. So region A, region B. The wave comes in from region A and enters another region, region B. Now if this is waves in water, 
which region is the wave faster? A or B? A, why? Why? So the waves are closer together, so it takes a shorter, it travels a sh shorter distance, so it should be faster. <laughs> warp logic! Warp lo <laughs> I'm trying very hard to come up with a warp logic. <laughs> you never know, some students have the most warp way of understanding things. So smaller distance, so it travels faster, alright? Distance over the same time, then faster. <laughs> So how do you know that it is faster? Well, there, there, are, there are some very important rules. There are some very important rules. Frequency in A and frequency in B. How do they compare? Same, yes, yeah, same, 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 same. Correct. And then how about wavelength in A and wavelength in B? Same, 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 same. same. <laughs> <laughs> this one and this one. Which one is bigger? A is more than B, therefore V of A is more than V of B. How do I know? Now, then you take a look at the ray. Can you see that the wave fronts must always be perpendicular to the ray? So the ray actually bend towards the normal. So it's going to a denser medium. So the speed decreases. Can? Cool? Now, we, I introduced to you the relationship between refractive index and angle. What I'm going to show to you over here is that, I'm not sure whether you have been taught this, you should be taught um, that n is equal to speed of light or speed of, uh, in this case, speed of light over speed of light in the medium. Am I right? So if I change it to 1 or change it to a, then this will be a. Then n of b is equal to c over v of b. So therefore, if we take n a upon m b, it is actually equals to VB upon VA. So this is other equation that you need to remember. Just now, I related the N to the angle. Now, I related N to the speed. Okay? So you need to know how to relate the two speeds of the wave with its refractive index. What sort of questions can come out? Most likely given three, and then you have to find the fourth. One last question. Um, which one has a greater depth? A or B? A, yes, correct. The deeper it is, the higher the speed. So, therefore, you got this. Actually, there's this equation V equals to GD, if I'm not wrong. There is D is the depth of the water. Yeah. But be, be careful that this speed over here is not the surface wave. Huh? It is if like tsunami, if you got a mass displacement of water the wave of the entire ocean. There's a different wave speed from the wave speed on the surface. It's the entire motion of the ocean. And that's the reason why if you take a look at tsunami in the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, where the depth can reach up to 11 kilometers. There's a Mariana Trench, if you're not aware. That's the deepest part in the whole world, uh, off Philippines coast. Um, and the speed over there can reach up to about 800 kilometers an hour. That means if you have a race between the wave in the ocean and the jet liner, the wave is actually about there. It's that fast. And that's the reason why when the tsunami waves hit the shore, where it slows down because the shore has a smaller depth, it slows down. And what happens to the water that's coming from behind? It piles up, correct. And that's why tsunami waves can go up really, really, really high. So that's the thing um, that causes. And that's the, also the reason why. In countries where the shoreline, where the shore is actually like this, um, say for example, you've got a country with this kind of shoreline, where it is shallow over a long distance, the tsunami damage is actually very small because by the time the wave hits the shore, it is actually it has already lost a lot of its energy. The countries with most damage by tsunami are the ones that goes like this because there's a very steep deceleration of the wave. And that's why the wave piles up really, really high, really, really near to the shore. So it depends on a lot of factors, the geographic, geographical structure and the land and the sea, the seabed of the, of the, of the country. Yeah? Yeah. So it's, it's actually quite, I, would, I, I hate to say this, but quite interesting knowledge. Lah. Even though definitely not interesting for the people hit by the wave. Okay? Again, sorry? Sense, sense, what was sense? Sorry. Why? 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 Why is it a Japan? Why does Japan think that? So they are 
Why don't Japan go like this? Uh? Yeah. Hey, ocean yeah. reclamation uh, or, or reclamation. It, you mean why don't Japan make their ocean all like this? Uh? Their, their shoreline all like this? Uh? Hey, hello, we, we are not in Minecraft left. You know, we are not in Minecraft left. Where you click, 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 uh, the, the ocean will change one there. <laughs> it's like click, 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 reclaim, reclaim, reclaim. You know how many years Singapore is going to take Singapore, which only has a shoreline of 100 kilometers plus kilometers. You know how long it's going to take Singapore to build up our defense against the ocean? Law? 100 years plan, eh, my friend. 100 years plan. Eh. And Japan has a dull, long shoreline. So, yeah, remember, remember it's not Minecraft. <laughs> it's not Minecraft. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's an interesting idea. Okay? Interesting idea. <laughs> yes, something interesting pop out over there. <laughs> You're still, you're still on Minecraft. Uh. You're still on Minecraft, uh. seriously. Hey, hey, but <laughs> not during timetable time, huh? Ah, don't have like live lesson one screen, YouTube, YouTube, Instagram, Minecraft, da 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 da. <laughs> Nine screens unrelated to learning, with only one screen related to learning. Now I know what happens when you're not looking at the camera but looking elsewhere on the screen. No? <laughs> and ferociously clicking away. Trying to reclaim the land to save Japan. No? <laughs> okay, Ken. Um, <laughs> now we shall move on to the next part, which is on um, quite a lot of things. So I'm slowly taking it off. So that I make sure that everything is covered. Um, the next thing I'm going to go to is this thing called intensity. Okay, intensity is a very, it's, it's very important quantity. La. Say for example, if you're being kicked by someone, guys, do you prefer to be kicked by someone wearing sports shoes or high heel shoes? Sports shoes. Okay, okay, sports shoes. <laughs> Obviously, right, if you get kicked by a high person wearing high heel shoes, it's going to be more painful because... It's more embarrassing. It's more embarrassing as <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah, I can. I, I, I yeah, can. Uh, I can. Not that I have experience. Uh, I can imagine uh, that it's going to be more embarrassing as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you got experience of being kicked by people wearing sports shoes or high heel shoes? Both. Oh. Wow. Uh, whatever reasons you uh, might want to share it privately. <laughs> <laughs> It's like pressure. It's like pressure. This this thing is like this this thing about intensity is like pressure. Um, when you're kicked by someone wearing high heel shoes, it's going to have the same force, probably the same force, exerted over a smaller area, so it's more painful. Yeah, it's like pressure. So light and sound also has this thing which is pressure equivalent. It's the same reason why this thing probably has a 50 watts um, power. It is less harmful to look at this as compared to look at lasers, when lasers has a power of about 50 milliwatts only. Yeah, but 50 milliwatts concentrated over a small, small dot. This one, 50 watts spread out over a big area. So that's why it is important for us to have this quantity power over area. Now, for most of the cases in your syllabus, you're going to handle cases where it's um, light sources or sound sources emitting light or sound in all directions evenly. All right? So what happened is that you have to have this uh, energy or this power divided by the area of a sphere. And what's the area of a sphere? For pi for the power cube. <laughs> what? For? <laughs> oh dear, it's volume. Yes, it's volume. Area is 4 pi r squared. Even the units itself cannot have a cube, alright? Otherwise, it'll be meter cube. Okay? So, intensity equals the power over 4 pi r squared. Therefore, can you see that intensity is proportional to 1 upon r squared? Alright? So, if you step two times the distance from a microphone, from a loudspeaker, it will have uh, one quarter of the intensity. Okay? But at this point of time, I would like to caution you to relate intensity and sound directly proportional. In the examples I'm going to show you, I'm going to say that intensity is proportional to sound, but do be careful that intensity and sound, they are not directly proportional. How we perceive sound is a very interesting thing. In fact, there is, this is a side, uh, this is really a side point. Um, there is this uh, hearing curve 
where if you were to plot the um, decibel, loudness is measured in decibel. If you had already handled some equipment to measure loudness, you know what this means. Decibel is a unit. It is on logarithmic scale. This shows you the minimum intensity or the loudness for sound to be heard. And it varies with frequencies. It varies with frequencies. Uh, and the minimum intensity where it needs to be heard, guess what's the frequency range about? Make a guess. 10? 10,000? 10,000, then, then, then most of the time when I speak, you'll be like, ah? What? <laughs> Unless I speak like, hello? Hello, hon? How are you? <laughs> then we are, oh. <laughs> Right? It's about actually 2 to 3 kilohertz. That's, that's the vocal range of most people. That's about there. And you see, that's the beautiful part about things. Our ears are designed to match our voice. Our ears is a most sensitive where we can hear. Imagine if it is offset to 10,000. Then most of the time we are... <laughs> and then, interestingly, then we wouldn't exist. Because if that's the case, then human beings would not be able to communicate properly to each other. There'll be misunderstanding, conflicts, tension. War, yes. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, war. I told you before, right? From the invention of language to the population increase. It's actually at the point of time where language was invented, population starts to go up. Because people can talk to each other now. Otherwise, you go to someone, it's like, Uga Gaga. <laughs> what is Uga Gaga? <laughs> you're gonna kill me or you're gonna trade with me? What is Uga Gaga? <laughs> yeah? So, so it, it's hearing is important. So, just want you to be cautious about the intensity and loudness. They are not such a simple concept. Intensity is absolute, we can measure it in watts per meter square, but loudness is a, is a more nebulous thing. As we age, in fact, the loudness, the hearing curve goes up. And that's why your grandparents will go, huh, when you talk to them, because they need a higher intensity at the same frequency to hear. So loudness is a very perceptive thing, whereas intensity is absolute. Yeah, you cannot argue that this is 50 watts per meter square, it's 50 watts per meter square. Can? So. Just cast this aside for additional knowledge. Let's come back to I proportional to R square. Let's do a question to see whether you can use this effectively, shall we? So let's take a look at this microphone and then you are dancing. <laughs> okay, shake, head shaking. Um, and this is five meters away. You feel that it is too loud. And then therefore you move backwards so that the loudness is half of original. Yeah? So you move backwards. Um, so do you, so the question is, what is x? If uh, we make this bold assumption, if loudness is proportional to intensity. Let's make this, this, this assumption. Uh, even though I mentioned that it is not, let's assume for simplicity's sake. That if loudness if loudness is half, intensity is half, in simple words. So half means you must move backwards by two times, right? So the answer will be five. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. The answer is five root two. X is five root two. Yeah, correct? Correct or not? Five root two. Careful, huh? careful, huh? read carefully. I want you to find X. <laughs> this is where you lose your one mark. Huh? This is where you lose your one mark. So is the answer 5 root 2 or not? <laughs> Anyone? Let's see what a no, this is three SF. Three SF. One point four. Two point two seven. Two point oh seven. Yeah. Two point oh seven is the answer. 
um, if you got 5 root 2 as the answer, it means that you didn't minus away the 5. Okay, can so and the reason is because the reason why 5 root 2 is wrong is because I asked for x, I did not ask for distance from the source. So you have to be very careful. Another typical trick that I can play is that the intensity is reduced by one third. Oh. By one third. So the answer will be, I mean, you, that, means that, this, that means the intensity, if this is i, the intensity over here will be 2 third i. Yes, correct. So be very, very careful about those kind of things. Open your eyes widely. Okay? There's nothing conceptual, it's just being careful. All right, Ken, so anyone couldn't get 2.07? Okay, okay, okay. Let, let, let me help you and show you the full working. So intensity original is proportional to 1 upon 5 square. This is half i original proportional to 1 upon r square, say for example. You divide, this will be um, 2 equals to r squared divided by 5 squared. r will be 5 root 2. So x will be 5 root 2 minus 5. That will be the answer. I think it's 2.07. 2.0 something. Cool? Ken? Okay, now the next relationship I wanted you to know is I is proportional to amplitude square. Be very careful that this A is not area. It is amplitude. Now just bear with me. There are only 26 letters in the English alphabet. Times 2, lower cap, upper cap, there are only 52. So A can sometimes be for area. A can be for amplitude. Yeah? So why, why not use M for momentum? There are some questions that I, ca I cannot answer. Now. That's, <laughs> that's how people decided it, and then that's how we use it. So I is proportional to amplitude square, not area square. Any questions with this? Come on, any questions? Yes. Loudness, okay, the full, okay. We don't call it loudness. The way we measure loudness is by this dB scale, which is 10 log I over I0, where this is the reference, the lowest intensity required to hear. This is the measure of loudness. Yeah, so actually it is a log I. Yeah, that means that if you increase the intensity by 10 times, you don't hear the loudness be increased by 10 times. It will increase by a very small amount, actually. So, to be very careful about the difference between intensity and loudness. And loudness, like what I said, is actually a perceived quantity as well. How sensitive your ear is. Can? Cool. So, this I proportional to A squared, this... Any questions on this? It's a three-letter word that I wanted to hear from you. <laughs> why, exactly? Come on, this is simple. Why? Yes, why? Why do you think this is the case? Now remember that intensity is equal to power over area, which is actually equal to energy over time over area. Okay? That means it's related to energy. Now when we talk about intensity, whether it's light wave or sound wave, they are all waves. Agree? And when they are waves, all the points, if you had listened to my video on 4.2, topic 4.2, um, which all of you commented on different things. All the things are not related to the video itself. <laughs> uh, just shirt, la, merchandise. La. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Come on, something more intellectual. Like, like sir, I disagree with this uh, point that you made. <laughs> and what, 2 minutes, 55 seconds. Uh, more intellectual comments. <laughs> merchandise. Fire, fire, fire. <laughs> okay, so intensity is equal to energy over time over area. So energy of a wave, remember SHM, all waves, uh, all points on the waves behave as, as undergoes SHM. And remember the energy of any particles going through SHM as this. That was our topic on SHM. That's 9.1. Um, so therefore, intensity, okay, I think I have to be very careful over here. This A over here is amplitude, this A over here is area. To just be mindful of the difference. And that's why intensity is proportional to amplitude square. Now once you're, once you're aware of why it comes about, you'll be aware that it also depends on frequency. The hidden assumption is that I'm treating frequency as constant. If I change the frequency, the intensity will change as well. Can? Yeah. 
And therefore, the third relationship is A is proportional to R. So these three are the equations that you need once you see the word intensity. Or anything that relates changes to intensity or amplitude with distance, these three equations will definitely come into play. Okay? Cool? Right, let's move on to the next part, which is um, this thing called okay, superposition. I'll leave it till later. I'll go through polarization. How many of you have a have a sunglass? Have a pair of sunglasses? Don't be shy. One. Serious? Nobody Only he that. has it, huh? Okay, you have it. Okay, right. And is your sunglass polarized? Well, polarized sunglass. Sunglasses. That's that's really cool. Do you participate in uh, water sports very often? Sorry, winter, winter sports. Oh, okay. Yes, you need sunglasses and you need polarized sunglasses, and I explain why. Yours is it sun? Is it polarized? Don't know. Ah, okay. <laughs> if it is, uh, how how expensive it is? Is it how expensive is your sunglass? <laughs> Okay, you sure it's not a piece of like darkened paper or like darkened tracing paper? <laughs> Three dollars? <laughs> sounds more like so, sounds more like a few pieces of wire with those kind of colored paper. <laughs> okay, be very careful eh? because if you go for cheap, really very very cheap sunglasses, you might run into danger of it being just 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 being darker. And what happens is that when it's darker, your pupil or your iris opens up bigger, right? And what happens is that if your glass is not UV, at least UV protective, it are opening the iris and allowing more UV to come in. And that's a bad thing. And I think the last part that you want to suntan on your body is the back of your eye. <laughs> Sun burning your retina. Whoa, wow. Scratch, scratch, scratch. <laughs> I don't know how you're gonna scratch up. <laughs> it's like oh, oh, scratch, 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 move back. <laughs> I think that's the last part you want to summon. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so yeah. Okay, so so it is very modern. Don't, please, uh, don't three dollars probably reconsider uh, getting another one. Yeah, we we, we. <laughs> instead of one piece of tracing paper, two pieces. <laughs> Okay, the reason why I talk about polarized sunglasses is I'll, I'll come to that. There's a reason for that. And the reason why you actually should have a polarized sunglasses if you go for winter sports because there's snow and there's a lot of reflection. So let's talk about polarization first. Now, when you have a transverse wave, yeah, when you have a transverse wave, now transverse wave require the wave to have the electric field, the oscillation to be perpendicular to the motion. Now, it doesn't say what plane, because if I have a beam of light traveling to you, it can go this way, this way, this way, this way, a lot of ways, agree? So there are so many ways that it can go about. So this is what we call an unpolarized wave, where there are multiple planes of vibration all happening at the same time. All right, so this is unpolarized wave. As you would have guessed, a polarized wave looks like this, where there's only one plane of oscillation. Now the reason why I didn't say vibration but oscillation is because in light you cannot say vibration. There's nothing vibrating. It's oscillating electric field. Right? So I use the word oscillation. So there's only one plane of oscillation and you need to know how to explain in IB. They can be you can be asked explain what is meant by a polarized wave. So the answer would be a polarized wave is a wave where there's only one plane of oscillation. Oh, the oscillation is only restricted to one plane. That will be a full mark answer. The question is, how do we move from here to here? Yeah, how do we polarize wave? Um, one of the way there are two ways in your syllabus. One of the wave, one of the ways is by reflection. So when you have light reflected off a surface, it can be water, it can be snow, it can be anything, even road. So once it reflects off, you have an unpolarized wave. And when it reflects off the water, most of it will be polarized parallel to the wave, uh, parallel to the, to, the, to the interface that you have. So the light that comes off will be oscillating this way. 
it be oscillating this way predominantly. Okay, um, there's something else in, the, but unfortunately not in your syllabus, so I'm not going to mention that, which is the Brewster angle. But you just need to know that when light reflects off any surface, it's predominantly parallel to the surface over here. The question is, three letter word question. Why? Why? Yes, correct. Why? Why? Why do you think that it is predominantly parallel to the wave motion? Oh dear, silence. Now you've got to understand what happens during reflection. You have to understand. Now light is an oscillating electric field, agree? Yeah, light is an oscillating electric field. So what happens is that the light oscillates everywhere and when it hits here, in any atoms in this world, there's always this particle that starts with a letter E. Electrons, exactly. So what happens is that when the ele oscillating electricity hits the electrons in the water, it need not even be free electrons. Any electrons that it hits, it causes the electrons to jiggle. So the electrons absorb, jiggle, 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 and then re-emit another photon or the wave out. Now think about it this way. When the electron oscillates, is it easy for it to oscillate this way parallel to the wave, uh, parallel to the surface or into the water? Parallel, exactly. So the preferred plane of oscillation is parallel to the surface. And that's why when the light is emitted by that electron, it is predominantly parallel to the surface. So, so it's only restricted to oscillate to in this plane. And that's why the light that comes out is restricted to move or oscillate in the plane that is parallel to the surface. That's a very interesting implication. That means that the light that you send onto the surface is different from the light that comes out. It's a different light. It's a different light. It's a different particle altogether. It's a different wave. Yeah, but to us, of course, we still see it as red light means red light or blue light means blue light, but it is actually a different blue light. It is a different red light. Okay. Now we come back to this, and that will come, and that's when I explain to you why is it important to wear polarized sunglasses when you are predominantly in water sports. We'll come back to this. So let's KIV this. This is polarization by reflection. And guess what's the next method? Method number two, polarization by using a a polarizer. La. <laughs> you polarize using a polarizer. La. <laughs> it's like, whoa, man. Okay, so you got a light that's coming in like this, and then you use a polarizer. A polarizer, I mean, as the name suggests, it has a certain preferred plane of polarization. So let's say, for example, this is the polarizing um, axis. Then the light that comes out will be polarized in the plane that is parallel to the polarizer's plane. Now you have to know this, if the intensity is I0, the intensity over here is I0 upon 2. Okay? It's always half, when it's unpolarized to polarized. Cool? Now, what you have over here is if, if I have a polarized light coming into here at an angle to the axis of polarization of the polarizer, then the light that comes out over here is going to be parallel to the axis of the polarizer, but the intensity is no longer going to be equal to I0. It is I0 cosine squared theta. Again, the three-letter word. Why? Correct. You think, why? Why? You ever watch this program when you're young called 十万个为什么? 10,000 wise, 十万个为什么? It's such an interesting program. It explains like all the things. Like in, and then the, the, the discovery science equivalent will be how things work. Um, yeah, that, that, that program. Okay, I'm going to explain why it is cosine theta square. Now, can you see that if my light oscillates in this plane, and this is the axis of polarization in this um, direction, can you see that the component of the electric field in this direction that is parallel to the axis of polarization is going to be equal to E cos theta? Agree? This is your electric field of your light. 
this is the axis of polarization of the polarizer. So the component of this in this direction is going to be cos theta because adjacent divided by hypotenuse is going to be cosine. Okay with that first before I use another idea. Okay? Now remember intensity is proportional to amplitude square. The initial intensity is proportional to E naught square because the amplitude of the initial wave is E naught. Final intensity is proportional to E naught square cosine squared. Therefore, can you see that intensity final equals to intensity initial times cosine squared theta. So the reason why this square comes about is because of amplitude square. The reason why the cosine theta comes about is because of resolving the electric field parallel to the axis of the polarizer. Okay? So that's the origin of the square and the cosine theta. Now the question is, how do you come up with this half then? Now the detailed derivation is inside your notes, but I'm going to give you a hint, uh, an idea of how it is being done. Now if a light ray is unpolarized, do you agree that there is equal probability, say if I send an unpolarized light through this polarizer, there is equal probability of the light being polarized this way, this way, this way, or any other ways. Agree? Then what you need to do is to cut up the light intensity into one small section, find this angle theta, and then allow this light to pass through. Then you integrate over 360. <laughs> Never mind, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Let's do it during HBL when I'm playing my Minecraft. <laughs> the detailed the, the derivation is inside your notes. Um, I'm not sure which slide, but it is definitely inside your notes. But the idea is basically you break down the light which is polarized in all direction into choose one axis of polarization. Um, this is probably d theta. Find the intensity that goes through this angle and then integrate it over 360. Okay? So, so I'll leave it to you. What happened is that during HBL, I'll explain in details. I'll derive for you um, as one of my modules online. Okay? I'll save it for the online thing. But all you need to do is that unpolarize to polarize, half, polarize to polarize, cosine square. Let's try a question and see whether you can apply. That's the most important thing. I'm going to go through two examples popular for IB. Um, you need to know this. Unpolarized light I naught passing through another polarizer theta, and the light comes out as I naught upon 16. So my question to you is, what is the angle theta? Very popular question. So the light passes through two polarizers. After passing through the first one, from unpolarized to polarized, then it goes through another polarizer. Oh, by the way, I think I forgot to mention that this, this principle over here, that I intensity final equals to I naught cosine squared theta is Malu's law. Malu's law. Yeah, yeah, correct. That's a, that's a, it's a stupid joke, but uh, if you don't know this, it will be Malu. Okay, so... <laughs> yeah. Which one? This is initial, this is final. Yeah, that's all. Okay, malus. Malus law. Yeah, malus law. Malus. <laughs> Interesting name. If you can go and find out his nationality, I can't tell. Like, Shironkov radiation. Guess what nationality? Uh, the Russian. Shironkov. Yeah, the cough. Uh, <laughs> there's some names you cannot tell like, whether it's Brit or US. What else? Uh? What else? 
any name that is very telling? Robert? Robert Bunsen. German. Oh, okay. Interesting. Max Planck. Heisenberg. Heisenberg, yeah. The Jew. A Jew. Heisenberg. You, do you know that Heisenberg at one point of time, is it Heisenberg? Yeah, Heisenberg at one point of time was racing with the US for the nuclear weapon. At one point of time. Oh, you should watch this. If there's a chance, I'll show you the video. It's, a, it's a, about geniuses versus geniuses. And at the World War II period, there is this uh, team led by, ah, uh, yes, correct, of Robert Oppenheimer, which is the US side leading the nuclear program. And then on the German side, you have uh, Heisenberg leading the nuclear program. So they were racing each other, in fact. It was a very interesting TV program, like how they, yeah. They actually know each other as friends, as fellow physicists. Yes, it's very interesting. It's, I don't think it's Feynman. He was on the Manhattan Project, but the leader is Robert Oppenheimer. Yeah, that's the yeah, young chap. He also invented the idea of um, how to, they had difficulty igniting the atomic bomb. They know how to make it the general principles, but they had issue um, in 98. And Robert Oppenheimer was in this co conference about black hole. And that's why he got the inspiration that to ignite the nuclear bomb, you need to compress it using uh, explosions. So what they do is that the very first model of atomic bomb is that they lay explosives around the uranium and then they detonate the explosives, compressing it into the critical mass and critical density. And that's when the explosion happens. So he got the inspiration from astrophysics. Yeah, and, and he got it from another place and then doing it, using it in the uh, nuclear weapon, which is rather interesting. Interesting, mm. interesting in a sense. Um, is atomic bomb absolutely needed to end World War II? The Japs were already losing and they will lose. It's a fact, they will lose without the atomic bomb. So is it absolutely necessary? Leave it to you to think about this, okay? <laughs> you must watch this program. It's on Netflix, I think. Netflix, if you have Netflix. And you have a lot of time, people. Watch useful program. <laughs> no, yeah, watch this girl. What was Socially Singapore or what? Whoa! <laughs> Socially Singapore, right? Or Singapore social? Oh, you ooh. cringy, cringe max, uh. cringe max. <laughs> Singapore social. <laughs> yeah, go and find, go and find. If you got Netflix, go and find. Type in search genius. I think it will come out. Yeah, it's a series of six episodes. I think about geniuses versus geniuses. There's another episode about. There's another episode about two, uh, the Wright brothers versus the Wright brother who invented aeroplanes and versus and none. <laughs> and the left, Wright brothers and the left sisters. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> yeah, uh, Wright brothers and there is this another person also trying to build a plane. So, so you, you find that a lot of inventions comes about because of politics and a lot of things. Uh. Do you know the television was invented by someone who is, I think, 18 years old only? Whoa! Yes. But he lost, he, he, he lost the battle, he lost the battle for the patent rights because he, the, another person was so much richer and he, he just dumped money to fight, or fight the legal battle. Lor. And it's the, it's the real life. If you have a, you have a person who is a, a startup owner and then versus a multi-billion dollar industry, you just need to draw the battle over years. It will exhaust the other party, which is exactly what happened. The 18 year old invented television, the key component required, but he didn't have enough resources to fight against that billionaire. Yeah, when the billionaire actually couldn't come up with the device which the 18 year old came up with. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's sad. It's, it's sad. It's sad. It's very sad, actually. You could, must watch it. Must watch it. Watch useful program, inspirational program. <laughs> Can? Yeah, and programs that are suitable for your age, people. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, huh? 
You know what I mean. By the way, 18 is not suitable for you, uh, by the way. Unless you are, you are anyone with 18 already? Huh? Uh, no. How oh, you're not 18? You're 20 or what? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yes, correct. So that's the question, that's the question. Why do we, how do you go to how do you go to like atomic bomb and stuff? So this one cancel off and therefore you have cosine squared theta equals to one upon eight, then the rest is really easy math. Like square root and then cosine inverse. Uh, remember to convert to theta uh, to angle to angle in degrees, yeah. Otherwise, if you have um, <laughs> you have theta equals to zero point two three degrees, uh, <laughs> careful, uh, Be careful. Uh, next one, similar question, but what I do over here is the i not that uh, sorry the i that comes out over here. I plot it against theta that I twist this polarizer. So it starts off with zero, meaning that it is aligned with the first polarizer. Then I start tilting it. Alright, so how does it look like? I just need you to go to 180 degrees because after 180 degrees is a repeat. So how will the intensity that comes out from here, if the incident intensity is I0, the outgoing intensity is I, how will I vary with theta? As the theta varies from 0 to 180. <laughs> Um, initial polarizer over here is? It's an angle. It doesn't matter because I'm polarized like the polarizer, it's always I naught upon 2. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what angle you do. Um, so I assume that the initial polarizer is at the vertical position. So initially, this is also vertical, so the initial angle is 0. Yep, it does affect in a sense that if my initial polarizer is tilted this way, then the light that comes out for me will be tilted this way. Yes, correct. Then if this starts all vertical, then the initial value over here will be less than the maximum reading. So to make this simple, I start out with both of them parallel, vertical. Yeah, then I tilt the second one. Okay? So it's a cosine squared uh, graph, right? So it should go down to zero. Agree? Okay? Correct? If you draw this, congratulations, you got half the mark. <laughs> it's like, what? You got half the mark. Because you were not careful with something in the question. Sorry? <laughs> what title? <laughs> what title? Come on, I'm not so chipo. I'm not so chipo. It's legit reasons. Because, because, which part is wrong? Yes, this is not I know, Nabibo. I purposely put I know over there. I purposely put I know over there so that you'll be tempted to draw from I know. It should start from I know upon two. Yes, correct. Correct. This is how optically it can trick you into believing that it is I know. Yeah? Careful. Very, very careful over here. Yeah. Cool. Okay, now let's go back to the case that I mentioned about the light reflecting off the surface. So we went through polarization by polarizer, polarization by reflection. So you've got light coming in this way, unpolarized, and then you've got light predominantly polarized this way. Say for example, light reflects off the surface, it is predominantly oscillating this way. So if I am a cool dude over here wearing sunglasses, Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the polarizer is polarized this way. It's kind of weird. Uh, if you want to find weird sunglasses, go and Google this brand called Gentle Monster. <laughs> and Gentle Gentle Monster. It has the weirdest sunglasses you ever find. Weird. Gentle Monster. <laughs> You'll find it. It's like what? Yeah. Go and go and search for it. It's and it's not cheaper. So um, the light comes, over, comes along this way, polarized this way, and if I were to wear a polarized sunglasses that is polarized this way, can you see that the light will be blocked? Because the angle will be 90, and cosine 90 is zero. So in what situation would I want to cut off the light that's reflected off a surface? When I'm skiing or when I'm in water sports? Because if you look at the water surface and it's all reflecting the, the sunlight, it's very distracting. And skiing, it will actually hurt your eyes. Uh, there's this thing called snow blindness or something like that. 
Yeah. So usually people who are involved in water sports, there'll be a lot of reflection of the surface of the water. You want to cut off that glare. The other situation is law enforcement probably. Because if you look at a car and you want to look through the windscreen, you can't sometimes, especially on a very bright day, you see the sky, right? Because it reflects off the sky. Therefore, you want to see through the glass. What do you do? You cut off the reflection from the sky. Yeah, you want to cut off the reflection so you can see the person inside. So usually in law enforcement or water sports, usually these two. If you're not in these two areas and you buy polarized sunglasses, um, either you have a lot of money because polarized sunglasses are usually about 100 to $120 more expensive or you've just been con. <laughs> <laughs> you just believe in things that you shouldn't believe in. Okay, Ken? That, that more, more expensive means better, 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 just better, <laughs> just better. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. What, what did your dad tell you? Ski. Come on. You don't put on ski goggles and go to the beach, right? People think that. <laughs> I'm sure you'll go on some social media platform. Though. Ski goggles to the beach. That would be really very interesting. <laughs> okay. Um. We have gone through most of these things and the last thing I'd like to go through which will lead on nicely. Um, this one and this one. Okay. At this point of time, probably I'll stop. I'll record the next as another video because it's a separate.